You're listening to the Fertility Docs Uncensored Podcast, featuring insight on all things fertility from some of the top-rated doctors around America. Whether you're struggling to conceive or just planning for your future family, we're here to guide you every step of the way. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center with another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. And I am here with my two lovely co-hosts, Dr. Abby Evelyn from Nashville Fertility Center. Hey, everybody. And Dr. Carrie Bedient from Fertility Center of Las Vegas. Hey. How are y'all doing today? I'm doing fabulous. So Carrie, I understand something interesting happened at breakfast today. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. So I, I sent this in a, uh, a text message for like this story to my, to my family and then a couple of our uh, real close friends. So this is a, um, a, a weekend story in two acts. So wow, this is, act. this is complicated. It sounds like, <laughs> no, it's really not. I'm just being overdramatic. Um, <laughs> so this morning, you know, my husband and I are, we get up, we're dealing with the last of the Christmas sorting out stuff, making sure we've got everybody covered fine. We go downstairs and we're like, okay, what are we going to do for breakfast? I offered to make French toast, which is his favorite. And I very rarely, I always have a, a loaf of just buttermilk white bread in the freezer because I use it for some of my cooking stuff. And, and I use it for when I make French toast, which is not very often because my kids are pancakes and waffles kind of kids. And so I offer to make French toast. And since I'm pulling out this loaf of white bread, I'm like, okay, I'll make egg casserole because it uses about a half a loaf. And that way I'll just kill the loaf off all at once because otherwise there is absolutely zero redeeming nutritional value in this loaf of bread. <laughs> um, there's actually a lot of sugar in bread. If you've ever noticed per slice, there's a lot of sugar in each slice. Oh, it's awful. It's absolutely awful. Like normally I make sure that we have a bread that's like brown because there's actual wheat in it, not because it's brown sugar or molasses food coloring. And there's actually nuts and seeds and things that have legit forms of fiber in them. So not the bread you use today, that wouldn't describe the bread that you use today, right? Oh you no. You can't totally. make French toast with, with all that healthy stuff. Healthy this stuff. is coming from it's the gluten-free because I have celiac girls. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this was devoid of all nutritional value. So I go through and I make the French toast. And as I'm making the French toast while it's cooking, I'm putting together the batter for the egg casserole, which is essentially bread and butter on the bottom, a layer of sausage, and then a layer of eggs, half and half and ground mustard. Like it's relatively simple to put together. So fine. So I've got my, um, my stack of bread and butter, I've got my pan, and then I've got my bowl with the egg mix- mixture that, that you know, my littles had very kindly helped me put together. So now my kitchen's a disaster. And my husband is the cleaner in the house. Um, I make the messes because I make the food and then he cleans them up because he can't handle it. And it works out very well for everyone involved. So we eat breakfast. I go back to putting something or other away related to breakfast. And I turn around and come back to the sink and I had my bowl of all the egg mix next to the sink and he picks it up and he puts it in the sink and he starts running all this hot water in it to clean it out. And I'm like, oh, no. no. Oh. And so a mild shouting match ensued of, you just dumped all the egg casserole away. And he's like, but it was right next to the sink. Of course I thought it was dirty. It's like, no, but it was entirely full. And he's it, was like, a full it was a full bowl. <laughs> yeah. Good grief. <laughs> it was a full bowl. And he's like, but it was right next to the sink. And I'm like, well, the trash can is right next to you and I didn't throw you away. Hey, that was a good, that was a great comeback, actually. No, I was really proud of myself. I usually don't think that you, fast. You won that food. one. Yeah. Um, so moral of the story is he, you know, remade the egg mix. Although it was kind of funny because I watched him crack an egg and he did it over the trash can and he dumped the yolk and white into the trash can and held onto the shell. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah that's just precious <laughs> it, it was really entertaining and so so how many times have you had him made or made him pay for that today how many times have you brought that back up during the course of the day oh only about a half dozen oh, okay I, like I feel like I've been very measured about it I mean it did only happen like an hour and a half ago so that was almost like an egg <laughs> pun there half dozen half dozen times <laughs> but I'm boom ching Tip your waitresses. We'll be here all week. Well, Carrie, I must say, I'm I'm really impressed that you cook that much. I even on a good day when I have lots of time, I wouldn't make a breakfast like that. Unless it was maybe Christmas, I might do it on Christmas. My kids love breakfast. Yeah, we do good breakfasts here. 
Uh, lunch, I think, is a waste of time, but we do we do good breakfast. Yeah, I try I try to just do two meals a day on the weekends, like late breakfast, <laughs> and then kind of early ish supper, and then you can have a snack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, easier the better. Members of my family don't wake up until about twelve thirty or one, so that makes it really easy to do that. <laughs> oh, I belong in your family, Abby. Some, someday, Carrie. I, I'm getting closer to that. I'm getting closer to that. You'll you'll be there someday. Oh, at one day. My hope one day. hope springs eternal. So, okay. So I've got our question of the week. Um, it seems pretty common that there's some discomfort towards the end of the ovarian stimulation before the retrieval. Uh, this patient says, I had nausea, cramps, bloating, and general discomfort. Are there any suggestions you have to mitigate some of these symptoms? All right, girls, what do you got? Hmm. Well, it's just the usual things. I mean, you, you can do heating pads. Um, and was this, she said during stimulation, is that right? Yeah, so she's talking about before the retrieval, but I think it's worthwhile to answer after retrieval as well. Because some of like, I'll tell people before retrieval, Tylenol is the only thing I want you taking afterwards. I think ibuprofen does a much better job. Right. But I don't want you taking ibuprofen beforehand. Although I'll be honest, I think the combination of Tylenol and ibuprofen, again, after the egg retrieval, actually, you know, supposedly it's supposed to work better. And I really do think it does. I had some hip injury this summer and it both of those together work better than ibuprofen actually didn't work that great for my hip injury. And I was really surprised because I would swear by ibuprofen, but the two of them together worked really nicely. So combos of those would be good. I think ultimately. I think it's a really important time to really listen to your body. Um, I think a lot of the women in our practices are used to going a mile a minute and that you have to understand it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot for your, your body to do what we're asking it to do in a very short period of time and um, like giving yourself like physical allowances that I may not be able to do everything that I planned on doing today, whether it's exercise or, or cooking or, or going in, you know, doing something that you normally do that wouldn't cause you a problem. Like it's okay to just be like, you know, Right now, my body's focusing on doing what it needs to to make a little human. And, um, you know, whether it's at the egg, you know, at the point where we're preparing your eggs or at the point that you're post transfer or whatever, um, we're, we're putting a, a little bit of a strain on your body. You know, being pregnant, um, although it is a very natural thing, naturally isn't necessarily easy. <laughs> And, mm -hmm. and especially in our society, um, we're, like I said, we're, we go, 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 go. And I mean, I even think back to when I did my egg retrieval. I mean, I literally was flying across the country and going right back to work and going a mile a minute. And, you know, it was fine that I could, but realize you don't necessarily have to like give yourself permission to focus on this time. Well, in season two, I think that helps not just physically, but I think you were kind of alluding to emotionally too, because, you know, you're right. We do go, go, go. And I think we all are the type of people and a lot of our patients are the type of people that have every moment scheduled. And I think sometimes, you know, if you want to give yourself an assignment of something to do, give yourself an assignment just to sit for like 15 or 20 minutes and do nothing or make it even harder, sit for an hour and do nothing. And I know for me personally, <gasps> it's really hard to do that. But you know, when I do, I feel so, I have so much energy after I've sat for that hour and just let my mind rest and let my body rest. And I think you're right. I think our patients are emotionally kind of going through the what ifs and should I've done this and what do I need to do? And I think if you can just kind of let your mind be for a bit in your body, I think that helps you recover. And I think that helps you feel better overall. I totally agree with that. I I think we as a society are very driven towards that. Um, I think even some of the ancillary resources that our patients have that are like, oh, you need to be eating this and you need to be drinking this and you need to be doing this. And there, there's so much focus on do, 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 do that, that I think that if we, if, if we as patients, not necessarily as physicians, but we as patients take a time to sit back and let our body need to do what it needs to do. It's okay. It goes back to the piece of advice of 
don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Good advice. And I think a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it comes down to the, just the pressure that our patients put on themselves. And when you do the comparison of egg donors versus intended parents who are going through, a lot of times the egg donors, even though they, they potentially have quite a bit more going on physically, they're doing a lot better because there's no emotional component to it. It's, it's they're doing, doing a kindness for someone else. And so they, they do better do, uh, through it, whereas the intended parent is going through and, and there's a lot more writing on it. So, um, you know, as far as the just practical tips and don't just do something, uh, don't just do something, stand there. It's also keep yourself well hydrated and mm-hmm. actually rest and actually sleep and put your feet up and take a deep breath and be kind to yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. So today's topic, because probably by the time this podcast gets released, um, the we would have aired our original COVID vaccine um, podcast um, a couple of weeks ago. Well, of course, as everything else in medicine nowadays, there are updates. <laughs> <laughs> and um, our national society, which is called the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, um, right after we recorded our podcast, um, fortunately, um, put out a statement, which I anticipate is probably one of many statements that will probably come out over the next six months to two years um, regarding regarding COVID-19 and um, the vaccine related to COVID-19. But we thought it would be really important to kind of let you know what our national society really has to say in light of specific for women who are seeking and currently undergoing fertility care. Um, So we're just going to kind of walk through um, the task force. Uh, So there's a specific task force that wrote the statement and um, the the statement date so that our listeners in the future know is December 16th, 2020 um, to kind of know what, what the task force thought was important for the general public as well as physicians who specialize in fertility medicine know. Um, so we're just going to kind of break this down bullet point by bullet point, and I'll take the first one that essentially says that we currently obviously have record numbers of people who are sick with COVID-19. And at this point in time, over 300,000 um, COVID-19 related deaths in the United States. And that at the present time, we're relying on things like social distancing and masking and hand washing and, and all of those things that we have been doing at this point for almost 10 to 12 months. Carrie, would you like to kind of take the second bullet point? Yeah. So the second one just discusses how on December 11th, the FDA issued the first emergency use authorization approval of a SARS-CoV-2, uh, vaccine, or excuse me, a SARS-CoV-2, which is the official name for the virus vaccine in the U.S. for the Pfizer vaccine to be distributed for individuals who are age 16 and older. And um, they mention in this guideline or in this bullet point that they're meeting again on the 17th, which was just a, a yesterday, actually, um, to evaluate the Moderna vaccine. And even though this um, bullet point doesn't address this because it came out just before this, they actually did offer the approved the EUA for the Moderna vaccine yesterday as well. So now there is the Pfizer available as well as the Moderna available. And my understanding of the two vaccines are they are equally efficacious. Uh Really the biggest difference between the two is they have essentially different delivery systems, which mean that um, the Pfizer vaccine does require more precise environmental control of keeping the vaccine kind of healthy and as it should be as compared to the Moderna. But realistically, for most people in the United States, it really shouldn't seem like a difference in whether you get Pfizer or Moderna. Is that y'all's understanding as well? That's yeah, that's what I understand. Yeah, they're they're pretty similar. And when you look at the the next point in the bulletin, they really talk about the mechanisms of the two vaccines, which are you know essentially the same, which is that they are mRNA vaccines. And so that is a, a coding um, instruct a set of instructions for proteins where what happens is the vaccine takes this mRNA 
and delivers it into cells that are near the the location of the injection. And that tells the body to make copies of that special spike protein that's on the coronavirus that you see in all of the the stylized pictures and all of the news and all these other places. The body then recognizes that as a foreign invader and says, make antibodies. One of the really beautiful things about this vaccine is that there's no active virus in it. It is just the little set of instructions. And so unlike many other vaccines that are out there, there is no active virus. There is no way that you can get coronavirus from this vaccine. Um, You get that little set of instructions. Once that set of instructions has worked and told the body, please make a set of protections, the antibodies in this case, against coronavirus, the body essentially just takes that little set of instructions, tears it right up, and throws it away. And hey, so, Carrie, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but I think it was a former CDC director that said that the mRNA in the vaccine is kind of like an email. It goes in your inbox, you read it, when you're done with it, you delete it and it's gone. And I think that's a great analogy for the mm-hmm. mRNA. And and I, I saw another example earlier that since you were making fun of me of being a millennial earlier, um, it's, a, <laughs> it's a Snapchat uh, version where... You get it, you see it, and it's gone. That's awesome. Yeah, because I think one of the fears, and ironically, I've talked to several people who are, you know, read a lot and know a lot, but a few people who really are worried about their DNA being changed in some way, and it really doesn't do that. It just codes for a protein, like you said, and then, Mm -hmm. you know, then it just goes away. The body just breaks it up and it goes away. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, Abby, what what does the task force say about um, mitigation measures? Well, one of the things it says is it's not known whether vaccinated individuals can spread the virus that they become infected with it. Um, I think there's a lot of unknowns that we don't don't know about it. Um, it takes time to develop protective immunity. And um, right now we know that it doesn't confer 100% immunity, although it does confer about 95% immunity against the development of getting COVID-19. So it's a really effective vaccine. I mean, it's probably one of the best vaccines that have ever, that's ever been developed that I'm aware of in terms of its ability to provide immunity. And I'd I'd like to just make a statement about the, that we don't know if the vaccine is going to help actually prevent the spread, but it helps prevent you from getting a bad case of COVID-19. Um, that's something that we will probably get a lot more information over the next six months to a year as we get more and more people vaccinated. Um, and that's where we end up getting more data just because of time. You know, um, it's, it's amazing what time will tell us. Um, but I would say that in most vaccines, that that is usually the end point. <laughs> and that's kind of what I'm expecting to happen, but we'll have to see what the data ends up showing us. Well, you know, Susan, there's one other thing I just saw today, and I'd heard this before that, you know, with any virus that stays around over time, it mutates and changes in a way. And I don't know if you guys saw this in the news today, but in England, um, they've really gone under, you know, a bigger lockdown for Christmas because there's a, apparently a new version of COVID-19 that tends to spread more rapidly. And right now, they think that it would be covered by the vaccine, but they're not 100% sure. So, you know, as you said, things are going to change rapidly, just like the virus is changing rapidly. Things or recommendations are going to change rapidly, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I do think that one interesting thing that ASRM has recommended is that the task force does not recommend withholding the vaccine from patients who are planning to conceive, who are currently pregnant, or who are lactating. Um, And these... um, Essentially, the task force did look at what the CDC was recommending, what the advisory committee for immunization practices um, what was recommending, ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gyne- Gynecologists, and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. And maternal fetal medicine is the group of doctors who take care of high-risk pregnancies once somebody is pregnant. Um, I think that's, that's a huge, huge statement. I think so too, Susan. I've had several people that are really worried about it. And, you know, frankly, even some of the people that I work with say, gosh, well, are we really going to recommend this to women who are trying to get pregnant? And, you know, I feel like if ACOG, our governing body and ASRM, our governing body, if they recommend it, I feel really comfortable telling patients at risk 
particularly on the front lines, that yes, you need to take it because in pregnancy, you always have to look at risk and benefits. And so, you know, we know that in some conditions like epilepsy, for example, we know that the medicines that people take for epilepsy can potentially cause harm to the fetus. But then you also have to counterbalance that with, well, what if somebody with epilepsy is driving in their car and they have a car accident, you know, Mm -hmm. so you can't really take them off their medicine. So you always have to look at risk and benefits and everything. Um, And I think what you really have to look at is, you know, are my risks um, such that I have a really high likelihood of getting really sick and maybe even dying if I get COVID-19 versus what are the risks potentially to an unborn fetus? And right now we think it's in the favor of taking it and preventing it before you get pregnant or or even during pregnancy. I was going to say to to skip ahead, actually, as part of that, talking about the risks, then one of the, the further guidelines says that recent studies have suggested that pregnancy is a risk factor for severe COVID-19 disease, and women who are pregnant or contemplating pregnancy may have additional risk factors, whether that's uh, weight, blood pressure, diabetes, things that outside of pregnancy are going to give them a higher risk of complications from COVID-19. So it starts to become a double whammy of if you've got someone who's just a diabetic, who is at a higher risk of having a problem from COVID-19, if they're a diabetic and pregnant, that's that's that double whammy of you're going to get even more severe disease. And that's why it's important to talk to your doctor about, you know, what what do they think is the best thing for your your situation because your doctor knows your health situation, what medical problems you and your partner may have and kind of all the things surrounding you to put your individual situation in a better light for you. It's a big decision. It really is. Um, so the task force also does make a statement that, like Carrie mentioned, that this vaccine is does not contain a live virus. So, um, and so it is not thought to cause an increased risk in infertility, first or second trimester loss, stillbirth, which is a loss usually in the third trimester, or congenital anomalies, or what most people know as as birth defects. And so that's that's very reassuring. Again, that's one of the kind of magical things about this not being, you know, a live vaccine or a killed a killed a, a live virus or a killed virus that people are are worried about. That it, it's just a coding sequence. And they also go on to further address the risk of those abnormalities um, as a result of potential fever that the vaccine can cause. Because in about 16% of people with a vaccine, usually after the second dose, you can get a fever. And they advocate that this is not a concern whether in deciding whether or not to vaccinate someone um, because they've found that even though a fever early on in pregnancy has been associated with difficulties in development and abnormalities in development of the neural tube, which is the the spinal cord and and that part of the body, that for women who are taking folic acid and more than 400 micrograms of folic acid, which anybody who's in our fertility practices should be taking, because that's just a prenatal vitamin, um, that that association went away. So that makes us think that it's more of a those patients weren't getting what they needed rather than it was the fever itself that was causing it. Um, And, and it also comments that if you have a fever, take Tylenol to kill it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the, really the last part is if, if you decide to get the COVID vaccine, that it's, that it is important to get your second dose because the first dose doesn't come does not convey that full 95% immunity that really you have to have that second dose and you really need to be committed to get it in the appropriate time interval. Um, And there are different intervals for each vaccine. Um, But when you get your, whichever vaccine you may get, they'll tell you when you need to be there, but you really need to commit to get it in that time frame. that, that, you know, there's some vaccines you can get like the first dose and, you know, you can get your second dose (laughs) a little bit more at leisure. I don't think we have the data to support that that's going to be an okay practice um, for this, that if you're, that if you're going to do it, you you really need to understand that it really is intended to have two parts. Well, one other thing I think you should consider is when we think about some of our live attenuated virus immunizations like MMR, you know, we used to say patients need to wait three months. Now we tend to believe we wait even less time before pregnancy. And again, this is not a live virus. This is just a little coding segment. And so 
you know, I think that makes me feel better that, you know, even if you're a month or two away potentially from pregnancy or say you're anticipating doing something in a month or two, my personal feeling is I really would lean toward encouraging my patients to get the vaccine because I just think, you know, your chances of going through a nine-month pregnancy and not having some exposure to COVID and having, you know, therefore the risk of getting really sick with COVID is kind of low with the way the numbers are going. And so I just think it's better to be safe than sorry. And if you're a month or two out for sure from trying to get pregnant or from doing something that you're trying to, to use to try and get pregnant, then I would really recommend for my patients anyway, really seriously considering the vaccine. I think it's a good thing. And in fact, I just took mine yesterday. So I'm looking forward to getting my next one in about three weeks. Yay. That's awesome. That's awesome. And it's something to think about if, if for the people who are listening, because I, I imagine there's quite a few people listening who actually have never been to a fertility doctor that, you know, to understand that it usually takes about a month to get your fertility evaluation done because we do everything pretty much based on a menstrual cycle that realistically from the first day you see your fertility doctor until you end up getting what your final diagnosis and plan and everything that's going to take about a month. So if you're in those early stages, you know, it, it might be a good idea to be like, you know, we're just going to, you know, take this month to get our information, get all vaccinated and, you know, kind of do our part to increase that immunity that we, we really need to get distributed you know, throughout the world. And I'd just like to reiterate too, I think this is a really strong statement from, you know, four different bodies that have a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. And, you know, my experience, sometimes when there's a lot of doubt or a lot of concern, I think our societies tend to be err on the side of caution. And I think if the people on those committees from the American College of OBGYN and the American Society of Reproductive Medicine were significantly concerned that there was an issue, I think they'd err on the side of caution and they would tell you not to get the vaccine. So the fact that they're saying they think it's okay speaks volumes to me. Yeah, actually, I, I shared some information about the vaccine on my Facebook page a couple of days ago. And a very close friend of mine who is an Air Force pilot um, actually made a statement that the FAA, <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know, <laughs> know much about it, but that the FAA is recommending it for pilots. And, you know, if anybody knows anything about flying and pilots, like they have very, very strict recommendations just as for general people who are thinking about getting, you know, the vaccine that even, even pilots are being encouraged to do this, which is, you know, very impressive. And, and so it, it's nice to see very stringent bodies who work that their job is to work to protect everyone, you know, regardless of what it is, you know, ASRM or the CDC or MFM, Society for MFM, um, you know, they're, they're wanting to make sure everybody is going to be the safest that they can be because, you know, each each woman and baby's well being is is really what we're focusing on, and and it is a very personal decision. And, and you know, there are going to be some people that it, it's not the right decision, you know, and, and that's okay. But I think that that is a decision that I do encourage you to discuss with your doctor, so that together you can weigh all the risks and benefits because you you may not be aware of all the risks and benefits in your particular situation. Any final thoughts, Carrie? I just keep going back to when I when I look around and I talk to all of the different subspecialists that that I'm friends with, having, you know, going through med school and residency and fellowship and just out in the community. It is so incredibly that group is so incredibly diverse. And pretty much every MD that I know is getting their shot and diving for it. And and it has been such a, a universal response. And, and like you said, there's outliers. There, there always will be people who choose not to. But the overwhelming response has been, I want to get protected. I've seen how bad this can be. And, and I don't want that to be me. And I don't want that to be my family. And especially when you're talking about pregnant patients, future children, families that especially our patients have worked so hard to get to. I think it is well worth well worth taking the vaccine when I was speaking with a, uh, an immunologist, um, so someone who specializes in, in all of these vaccines and all of that. I was talking with uh, someone on Thursday. Um, he said, pretty much everybody is going to walk out of 2021 with 
coronavirus antibodies in their body. It's either going to be <laughs> from the good, vaccine good or it's going to be from getting it. One way or the other. One way or the other. And so, you know, it, you choose the way that you want to go. But, um, but yeah, so... All right. Well, on that note, on that note, (laughs) good stuff. Good information. I imagine we will probably do another update um, when we have more information about the COVID vaccine. We'll be always learning and we may just be adding tidbits here and there because we know that it's an important part of everyone's life um, at this moment in time. So to our audience, thank you for listening and be sure to tune in next week for more Also, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. You can also visit fertilitydocsuncensored.com to schedule an appointment with any of us or submit any specific questions you have about infertility. All the questions will be answered on the podcast anonymously for our Ask the Docs segment. And don't hold back. The more embarrassing, the better. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.